Okay, welcome to everybody. Uh, apologies for the delay. Unfortunately, uh, we, had, um, <coughs> we had a wonderful day, nice weather, beautiful place, uh, but there was a bit, uh, a, a little inconvenient with the transportation. Uh, and so only now um, we uh, could uh, um, be all together. So it's my pleasure to open uh, uh, our conference uh, on opportunities and challenges in regulating robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, I will just say two words and then uh, give the floor to Professor Ryan Carlo, which will uh, um, introduce uh, the uh, general topic of our, of our meeting. So welcome at the European University Institute. Uh, we are now in this um, unique uh, um, European um, institution, a unique environment for uh, uh, research and PhD teaching in uh, uh, social sciences. The UI includes uh, four departments, uh, law, economic, uh, politics, uh, and, um, and um, history. And uh, it has a big uh, um, um, institution which is about 600 uh, PhD students uh, and, many, and many researchers. Here we are in Villa Salviati, which is a beautiful uh, uh, Renaissance medieval uh, building. Uh, it was uh, um, built uh, in the uh, 15th century, but there was a castle even before here. There are a lot of uh, stories about uh, this building, um, but uh, I will not have the time now to, uh, to tell them. But uh, maybe we can go for a walk later and uh, we will see the building and learn something, something about it. Um, so I think uh, I uh, stop here. It's a honor to have uh, uh, all of you here with us and I look forward to our conference. Welcome to the UI and to uh, the conference. Uh, just one more, this conference, this conference is supported by the uh, UI and also by Google who has gener generously contributed to our, to our event. So after this, uh, I give the floor to Professor Carlo. Professor Carlo is a real pioneer in uh, the domain of uh, um, law and, uh, and robotics. Uh, he has, uh, I think, uh, more than maybe anybody else uh, uh, contributed to starting this discipline. He's now professor at the uh, University of Washington uh, uh, School of Law, but he's also a co-director with um, uh, the University of Washington Tech Policy Lab and in the interdisciplinary research uh, which is uh, involved uh, in the uh, focus, the real focus, the very focus of our conference. So thank you for being uh, uh, with us, Ryan, and I'm happy to give you the floor. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, well, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, so, uh, so, let me start off by saying that, um, you know, this event for me is a real um, a homecoming. Um, and it's a homecoming for, for two different reasons. Um, the, the first reason is that I actually grew up here in, in Florence. Uh, and when I was a kid, I, I lived here for, for about five years. Um, and so for me to come back to Florence and to be able to walk around and to see the sights has been really uh, nostalgic and emotional for me. So I really appreciate that. But it's a but it's a it's a homecoming for grazie. It's a homecoming for a second reason, which is that um, you know the very first robotics uh, law co uh, conference that I ever attended was ten years ago here um, at at this very same venue. Not not this exact room, but but this very same institute. And what's astonishing is you know Gio Giovanni Giuseppe Tala. <laughs> Good to see you. You know, what's astonishing is that Giovanni mentioned the fact that, um, that I've done a lot of work on, on robotics law, and that's true, but you know, even as I was entering the field, there were several Italians who were already in this field. In fact, the Italians overall have been at the absolute forefront of uh, robotics and roboethics. I think really the movement in many ways started in Italy at places like this, um, at, in, in Pisa, um, in Bologna and, and, and others. And many of the people who are pioneers of that movement are here, uh, are here actually now uh, with us uh, uh, assembled at this event. Um, and so, so both because it's a 10-year it's a, it's a, a anniversary practically of the first robot law uh, conference I've ever been to, and because of my connection here, I'm really happy to be here. So what I'm going to do right now f briefly is I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are with robots and, and artificial intelligence, um, why 
we're talking about them so much these days um, because while many of us in this room have long been interested in robotics, artificial intelligence, and the law, the, the this recent years have seen an enormous growth in the conversation, and it's really uh, obviously captured the public imagination in a way that it had not before. And very, and very importantly, you know, policymakers at a local, national, international level um, are really becoming very, very interested in the, in the topic. I'm going to talk about why that is. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the United States approach to law and technology and how it relates to robotics and try to contrast that with what I understand to be a broader frame that many others take. And really the point of this discussion today, as I understand it, is to um, create a robust ongoing dialogue between researchers um, you know, in Europe and, and particularly in, and in the United States and Canada and to make sure that we're all aware of each other's methodologies and aware, aware of each other's insights um, in a robust way going forward. Um, I will try not to take uh, too long because I know that we are behind on time, um, but, uh, but let me jump right in. So first of all, so what is a, definitions really matter in this space. And so I'm going to start with the definition of robots and then with the definition of artificial intelligence. These are technologies that are quite difficult to define. I actually asked one of my information science PhD candidates last year to look at all the definitions of robot that she could find within, this is what you do with graduate students sometimes, and I apologize, but um, I asked her to look at every single definition of robot that she could find in all these different literatures. So she, she used the WorldCat system, which, which basically shows you all these different literatures. And we, we looked at definitions of robots. And one of the fascinating things that we found, mostly Megan found, um, was the fact that depending on your discipline, you might define a robot differently. So for example, if you're a mechanical or electrical engineer, the definition of robot tends to be programmable machine. In order to differentiate a robot, which has many different uses, from a, a single use system. So, electrical and mechanical engineers are interested in these systems that can be programmed to do lots of different things, and so they talk about robots as programmable machines. Contrast that to the humanities, so film studies, literature studies, those definitions of robots are radically different, and they tend to, to define robots as being artificial people. Because what these disciplines are interested in is the way in which robots resemble us and, and, and stand in for us. And so in, in, in the humanities, good to see you, <laughs> ciao, ciao. Um, in, in, the, in the humanities, um, we talk about robots the same as we talk about uh, Frankenstein or the Gollum, right? I mean, and so it's almost the same topic. And it's radically different from in, from in engineering. You know, the, the definition that I've always gravitated toward is the computer science definition. And that definition defines robots as being distinct from previous and constituent technologies because they're able to sense the world, they're able to process what they sense, and that they in turn can act upon the world. And to me, that has been the most generative. That's been the most um, sort of creative source of legal questions so far. Um, Although, for reasons I'm going to get into in a moment, it hasn't been what the courts have been focusing on in the United States, at least. Okay, so that's what, what, that's what robotics is. Um, why are we talking about them now, given the fact that robots have been around for, for many decades? I mean, since the, at least the 1950s, they've been, they've been used commercially. Um, I was just talking to some of, uh, some of the speakers here about you know, contemporary, um, uh, contemporary manufacturing robots, and I'm sure they've come a very long way, and I know that they're much more versatile, but we've had these robots for, for some time. Why are we talking about them now? Um, you know, part of the reason that we're talking about them now is, has to do with gains in uh, the other topic of the conference, which is artificial intelligence. Now, not entirely. I mean, there are certain things around robot dexterity and balance and, and uh, co-robotics working with people, um, differences in actuators where we're, we're moving away from just some certain kinds of configurations of actuators. Actuators, um, non lo so la parola in italiano, ma, you know, <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the hand itself. Come si dice? Okay, it's this. Okay, actuator. Um, when I was growing up here, my father didn't speak Italian, and he would just add an O or an A to any word, and that would be how he said So actuator would be actuatore or something. Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, 
so that's been changed, but a lot of the things our benefits are from are from gains in artificial intelligence. So then what is artificial intelligence? If robotics has these different definitions. Well, again, there is no consensus definition of artificial intelligence. I've worked closely with American regulators, um, such as um, uh, the uh, Senator uh, Maria Cantwell, who's a U.S. Senator in my, in my state, about definitions of artificial intelligence. As best I can figure out, there's no consensus definition, but artificial intelligence is a set of techniques aimed at approximating some aspect of human or animal cognition, right? It's not any one thing, there's a wide variety of approaches, but it's a set of techniques that are aimed at approximating um, something that a person would do uh, or an animal would do with their, with their mind. Um, okay, so why is that exciting? Well, that's exciting today, not necessarily, I mean, again, artificial intelligence, that term was coined, as many of us know, at my alma mater, Dartmouth College in 1950s. I wasn't there yet, you know, but, um, but at the time, this is, this is like, you know, um, this is the earliest days, that term was, was coined. Um, and we've been doing it for a long time, so why the enormous excitement about this thing now and, what, and what's different? Well, the, the, the basic difference, as far as I can understand it, is because of an acceleration, an acceleration, mind you, in the pace at which robots and artificial intelligence are, mas are mastering tasks that are historically reserved for people, okay? So that, that word acceleration, I think, is extremely important. It's not the velocity, ultimately, it's the acceleration. It's not that, that robots are gonna be replacing all of us in a moment. It's not that they're replacing all of us, at a, you know. It's just that there's an acceleration and we're feeling this vertigo. We're, we're experiencing this idea that suddenly this idea of substituting for human cognition, for human tasks, is accelerating. And that, I think, is really what's driving a lot of the conversation at a public and even at, a, at an academic, academic level. Things like the ability to recognize patterns because of a confluence of enormous data sets and massive access to computational power and some improvements in algorithms and statistics um, is leading to pattern recognition activities that just were not thought to be feasible um, uh, you know, only a few years ago. And, and that is allowing for uh, human-looking tasks to occur at a, at a dizzying rate, and I think that's what's driving a lot of it. Um, you know, in robotics, uh, I think that advances in, 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 as I said, in actuators, the, the development of co-robotics, the idea that robots now have to work with people, whether they're people driving cars and cars driving themselves, or they're people working alongside robots, uh, and so on. And, 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 and that has, again, just put people into contact with robots and reminded us that there's more and more things that they can do. Okay. So, you have this acceleration in robots and artificial intelligence appearing to replace what people do. You have these gains in pattern recognition, these gains in, in subtlety and actuation and the like. Um, what kinds of law and, po and policy challenges do they bring? Well, I want to start off with what I think that the United States model roughly is. Now, this is not every academic in the United States. I don't speak for every academic in the United States, of course. Uh, many of them are represented here and will speak for themselves, and then there's a whole community. But one of the things that I, I believe is go going on in the United States is that we are caught in the grips of what I would like to call a substitution paradigm to law and technology. So what I mean by that is that the story is roughly as follows. Once upon a time, something was done by a person, okay? We had certain legal protections and certain expectations. Now that activity is being done by a machine. And because it's being done by a machine, because there's been a substitution, now there is a gap, a lacuna, a distance between what the law expects and, and, and can do and what, is, and what is actually the case. So for example, once upon a time, uh, uh, human surgeons perform surgery. Now, surgery is being done by robots, right? Um, there are expectations that the law holds about law and policy that no longer obtain. Um, once upon a time, people drove cars. Once upon a time, people translated, right? Again and again, this is idea that, that, that we are substituting for, for prior practice using machines. And then the role, ultimately, of the, um, uh, of the, the law and technology scholar, often in the United States, um, is to figure out how do we restore the status quo ex ante 
by which I mean, how do we make things like they were before? How do we restore the protections that occurred? For example, once upon a time, judges used to decide how long you'd stay in jail or whether you'd be paroled. Now those decisions are being done by algorithms. How do we restore due process? How do we make sure that we can explain results? How do we, and, and so on. And so the, 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 what to notice about the substitution paradigm, which I can give you more and more examples of, is that it is at once very progressive and conservative. It's progressive in the sense that it anticipates and welcomes technological change. The substitution approach says, look, technology is going to change. People are, you know, things that were done by people are going, to be done by, are going to be done by machines. We get it. So it is very welcoming and accepting of changes in technology. And in that way, it is progressive. It is focused on the future. But it is also very conservative in the sense that the central aim is to restore the status quo. Right? That is to say, what we seem to be trying to do is to figure out how to make it like it was before when a person used to do it. And that is a very conservative intuition. It's, a, it's an intuition that's very embedded in a common law system like that of the UK or of the United States, where again, you know, we're trying to um, respect precedent and we're trying to restore the status quo. Now, that's very important, right? If people lose rights, they sh those rights should be restored. If people you know, have less dignity, that dignity should be restored. There's nothing wrong with that, but I just want to observe that. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've really learned from interactions with Europeans and with a certain set of, of U.S. scholars is that that's not the only approach. Substitution's not the only approach. We don't necessarily have to think to ourselves, well, you know, used to be done by people, now done by machines. How do we restore the law and policy like it was before? Um, I'm struggling with what to call the alternate approach. One of the words I've been using is an American word I think there's no translation for in, in, in Italian, but it's the notion of affordance, the affordance paradigm. Now, there are many Italian words like magari, where you just cannot translate it into English, and that's, that's the beauty of these words. I don't know that affordance has a translation directly to, to but, but it's the basic idea that, you know, people, that an environment affords us different opportunities. Right? That, that an environment, uh, depending on, 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 on ourselves and the environment, we, we actually have different capabilities within our environment. It's this idea that they're, um, these, it's about capabilities. Um, and the affordance paradigm would ask about what new affordances, what new capabilities do robots and artificial intelligence present? Okay? And then having done that, the task of the law would be to figure out how to best channel these technologies toward a common end of both law and technology, which is human flourishing. Okay? So to give you an example of, of the difference in those two analyses, a substitution paradigm would look at artificial intelligence in the, in the criminal justice system in the United States and say, gosh, it's too bad that once upon a time things that were done by judges are now done by machines. And when they're done by machines, we have to be very nervous because machines are inscrutable and they, they, they don't have human judgment and, and, it, and it's really a problem. And so we need to figure out how to restore those process values. So that's, a, that's an important conversation. But one of the things that, that an affordance approach might yield is to say, well, look, there are lots of problems and lots of guarantees that we make in the American system that we are not able to actually deliver upon. Right? We want access to justice. We want um, equity. We, we want um, a speedy trial. That's one thing that the Constitution of the United States guarantees is a speedy trial. We're not able really to deliver those things today. I mean, the speedy trial litigation under the Constitution of the U.S., it, you know, we're talking about a year before you can bring a speedy trial claim. <laughs> one year. That's not fast, right? Um, so, and, and so on. And so, uh, isn't that crazy? Much about the Italian, ah. <laughs> That's true. Maybe we'll compare that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you were, you're laughing for the opposite reason that I thought you were. <laughs> this is this is why we have a comparative uh, perspective. But anyway, a year strikes me as a long time. Maybe relativo, si dice, vero? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, but the point of the matter is, is that if we can gain certain things from artificial intelligence, 
um, that allow for greater access, that allow for greater for speed and dispensation of justice, well then we will, we will actually be able to deliver upon, upon the ends of law that, that have long been held but not been done, and maybe to do other things. So for example, in the United States, there are people who cannot see their day in court because they speak another language, they don't speak English, and there's no translators available, right? And yet every single one of us has a translation device in our pockets that can use, be used roughly well. Now there are perils with trans translating for purposes of criminal justice using machine learning, but it can be done and it's pretty robust. Um, and so it's astonishing to me that the American legal system will embrace things like risk assessment to figure out whether you should be paroled while ignoring right, the ability. Or another example would be docket management, the idea of, 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 of uh, handling cases in a particular order based on optimization that's done. These are the things that artificial intelligence does very, very well. Okay, so I, I don't want to take up uh, much more time and I'll close in the following way. Um, if we begin to see that there is both a substitution paradigm available to us and also a bigger blue sky thinking sort of idea about the new affordances of robotics and artificial intelligence, um, I think we can be asked some very provocative and interesting questions. And the kinds of questions that I hope we talk about today with the various experts that you have um, assembled here are questions like, are the costs and benefits of new technologies like robots and artificial intelligence being evenly distributed across society? That's not a substitution question. That's a question about whether or not everybody, whether they're vulnerable or wealthy or not, are gaining and losing equally from the introduction of these technologies. Um, do governments and other elements of society have the requisite expertise to assess and channel new technology? Are we able to channel technology towards, towards human flourishing do we have within government and others the ability to do that, the expertise to do that? Um, I mentioned this already, but are there places that our respective societies, Italian and, and, and European generally, and the United States and Canadian and so on, where, where our aspirations or promises fall short where new technologies might be able to help? Um, and finally, and this is something that we talked about in the uh, taxi cab over here um, this morning as well, are there lines that we need to draw from the outset in order to protect certain conceptions of what it is to be a person, right? To, to paraphrase James Moore, who is my professor at, at Dartmouth College, actually, and is a, a pioneer in the philosophy of, of, of uh, computer ethics, maybe there are certain things that, that, that computers must never do involving not carrying out human values, not executing our values, but establishing what those values are in the outset. And are there certain things that we should be, that we should be reserving exclusively for, for people? Um, so our, our purpose here today, as I conceive of it, is to talk about these questions and others, and especially to listen to one another. These are very big problems, and no scholarly community can handle them in isolation. And of course, the ramifications of these issues are not confined to a single country. They are global, truly comparative and global. Um, so so over the course of the next couple of days, I hope we learn from each other, and I hope also that we learn how to speak to each other, because these two things are different. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to it and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. This was really um, a stimulating um, and enlightening uh, um, presentation. I, these two, the two approaches that, we, that, you, that you distinguished, uh, the substitution and the affordance approach, are really two different ways uh, in which uh, uh, we, uh, we look uh, at, uh, at AI. And uh, uh, I fully agree with you that uh, we should look also at opportunities, not only at the risks that uh, AI is delivering. I don't know if, as European, as as Europeans, we can really um, uh, claim ownership uh, over the Afondas approach. Uh, maybe, um, 
maybe we are also uh, more into uh, what you call the substitution uh, paradigm or even maybe sometimes rejecting uh, a novelty just for uh, fear of uh, uh, what may happen. Um, but uh, I would like now to um, maybe give, uh, ask if there are uh, uh, any questions that uh, we are a bit late, but maybe you can collect uh, one or two comments or questions uh, to, um, to Ryan's uh, um, presentation. Oh, please. Uh, Hi, uh, Nihal Buter, um, uh, the Chair of International Law here at the European University Institute, um, and I've done some work on autonomous weapon systems. Uh, I'm just interested in the affordance paradigm and to think about that a little further. Um, there are clearly a lot of anxieties in relation to the production of autonomous, in, in the emergence of autonomous weaponry concerning substitution, substitution of human judgment for judgments that we, in one way or another, feel much more comfortable humans making, even if they're more likely to make them incorrectly. Uh, but another feature of this uh, debate has been a lot of attention to the problem of machine, of automation bias in human cognition. Uh, and that's it, that seems to be particularly relevant when you're thinking about lethal activities, right? Because if, if, if the machine or the, the interface tells you it's a lawful target or it gives you a probability, um, and there's a problem of automation bias. Now, on the one hand, you could say, in the context of affordance, we're, it's the possibility of doing things more accurately than we could do, right? You've got all of this data, and indeed, I think some of you may know, under Project Maven, Google has been contracted by the Defense Department to help generate artificial intelligence tools that could uh, assist using all of this massive data that's, that's gathered by drones in order to, to assist targeting, to distinguish objects, etc. So that has the potential of holding out um, greater uh, accuracy, but one of the fears is automation bias, you know, that, that, that we think, oh, well, the machine said it, it said it's 95% probable, and so I authorized the strike. I mean, it, this seems to be a real problem for the affordance idea. I was wondering if you think about this. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, that's an excellent, an excellent um, point, um, and something we also were talking about. It was a very interesting cab right over here. Um, uh, and, uh, but what, what I would say about the affordance approach is, um, is, is it's, it's, the affordance approach does not assume, I think, that, that um, any given use of technology would be o overall beneficial. I think it, it, it acknowledges the fact that, you know, for example, you, you might have a, a, a human doctor um, who diagnoses cancer and decides that they see a lot of the same patients and someone comes in and, and they have certain symptoms and the, and, and the doctor says to herself, um, okay, I know what this is and then diagnoses it and has a set of treatment. And then says, well, you know, wait a second, you know, I'm gonna, gonna just go over here and ask Watson to see if Watson has a different diagnosis. And Watson crunches the numbers and, and agrees with the diagnosis. Or perhaps Watson, this IBM computer system, comes up with it, you should look at this option. And she says, wow, you know, I hadn't considered that option, and I haven't been reading that literature, and I'm gonna go look at it, and may maybe makes a better, so that's the dream, right, is that you, she has a new affordance that is this system. But you're talking about the dark side of that, which is the idea that human beings would um, come to be either de-skilled, like not have the capacity to make decisions themselves, the way that I can't get around anymore because I rely on my GPS um, device. Um, that, that we could even, um, in a sense, abnegate moral responsibility, that we, could, that we could come to rely on these systems. I mean, one example from um, Peter Singer's book, Wired for War, which is now quite an older example, uh, uh, talks about an incident where um, we just, you know, the, U the United States uh, destroyed a, a commercial jet because the system had misread it as being a hostile, potential hostile things, and the, and the soldier just didn't have the, wasn't habituated to check just to make sure that that was true. And so this is an issue. So I don't mean to say that it's all, you know, moonbeams and unicorns and light, but, but at the same time, I do think that we should be looking holistically at what our goals are as a society and, and as individuals and seeing how these things can further them and what the dangers are. And that's where law and policy comes in to make sure we're channeling it. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so it's an excellent point and I completely agree. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Andrea Bertolini, for those that don't know me. Um, 
my question is about exceptionalism. So uh, I, I agreed with most of what you said, uh, but I had never was a big uh, 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 exceptionalist when it comes to robotics or AI. Uh, or AI. So I think that uh, yes, they, they uh, pose some questions and yet they can be framed within the existing frameworks. And the big question is whether the framework we have is the best possible. So it's, this is a kind of policy analysis of how could the, the framework uh, be improved. But I, I, I'm not so much in favor of considering uh, uh, even radical innovation like robotics and advanced AI as, as something that is um, disruptive for the legal system. It might be technologically disruptive, but not, so I don't see a, a dimension of exceptionalism in, in, in robotics and AI, so. Yeah, I, please, I mean, so, um, and you know, that's, that's part of, you know, why we're here is to, is to, ch is to ch because I have a different view than you, and you know this, right? So, we, so we've talked about, I mean, so, so it's, it's, it's fundamental, a deep fundamental academic question about whether robots and AI are really any different from previous and constituent technologies and whether such a dynamic and, and diverse system, legal system, such as the US or European system, shouldn't just be able to handle it, right? Um, I want to give you two quick examples and then I, I, I think we'll probably cut it off because I've gone on long enough. But two quick examples are, you know, in the United States, there's been a bunch of cases where courts have really struggled with whether a robot was more like a person or more like a machine, right? So for example, in the United States, we have this uh, somewhat terrible restaurant chain called Chuck E. Cheese, and I don't think you guys have this here, but Chuck E. Cheese is for kids. It's a pizza restaurant for kids. <coughs> and it has these robots that are like these animatronic robots that are in a band. Okay, and so Chuck E. Cheese, like they, they, they have like a, there's like a huge mouse and like a funny, uh, there's actually kind of a somewhat uh, racist Italian cook, you guys would be interested in this, uh, that really, really, it's really not, um, it's not a proudest uh, academic institution, or a proudest institution in the United States. Anyway, the Chuck E. Cheese has these anthropomorphic robots that will entertain the kids by coming alive and playing in a band. Um, okay, right, so in, in Maryland in the 1990s, a, a, some, tax authority went to the Chuck E. Cheese restaurants and said, Chuck E. Cheese, um, we noticed that you're having a performance in your restaurant, and you have to pay a tax on performances. So when you pay a performance, you have to tax your food, and you're not doing that. And Chuck E. Cheese said, tax? What you, there's no performance. This is just a bunch of robots. There's no people. And the court had to struggle with whether or not robots could perform. And it went into great detail about the nature of humans and spontaneity and all these different things. And this has happened time and again when U.S. courts have struggled with whether something was like a person or not. Another example is when we imported, when we imported, um, uh, uh, the first imported uh, to toy robots from Japan, there was a difference between uh, what, you, what normal toys would cost in terms of a tariff, the tax on, on things coming in, uh, versus dolls. For historic reasons, dolls were taxed at a, at a lower rate. And the way that we defined dolls at the time was that, that, that dolls um, represent something animate. You know, and the court had to figure out whether robots represent something animate. Anyway, th these are struggles that I've not personally seen really outside of, of robotics, and I can give other examples. So, so I mean, I I, overall, I agree with you that like, the system is dynamic and we will adjust to it, and I think that that's totally right. But, it, but for me, it, that these robots do present certain genuine puzzles that differ from other things. I, I would love your reaction, and then I promise I will, you won't hear from me again for a long time. Yeah, sorry. We need to move on because we are, um, we are um, late with our schedule due to the uh, issue that I mentioned before. So um, I'm very happy to move now to the uh, first panel uh, um, of, our, of our conference. Uh, th that will be devoted to, autono to autonomy. Um, so this is um, uh, quite a, an interesting and puzzling issue because, you know, the traditional uh, image of a computer is that of a kind of stupid uh, slaves. We give uh, computers instructions uh, and they execute them blindly, uh, faithfully delivering uh, uh, what uh, the programmer expected, unless uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is a mistake. Uh, but uh, AI and robotics deliver us a different image of uh, a computer system, the idea of the system that are, in some sense, autonomous. 
they are able to uh, give rules to themselves, this is autonomy, to govern themselves, uh, to self-determine. Um, and this raises um, um, a number of issues. To what extent uh, is uh, autonomy real? And if it is real, uh, what uh, does this uh, involve uh, for uh, our interaction with robots and their regulation? So I'm very happy to give uh, um, the floor to, our, uh, to the first speaker of this uh, um, session. It's going to be Jan Kerr. Jan comes from the University of uh, Ottawa. He um, is uh, uh, the chair of the um, uh, Canada Research Chair in Ethics, Law and Technology, and uh, he has uh, um, a unique four-way appointments uh, in four different faculties, so really an interdisciplinary um, scholar. Um, and he has uh, done pioneer uh, um, leading work on privacy, among other issues. So I'm very happy now to give uh, uh, to Jan the, um, the floor and um, he's going to uh, discuss uh, the agentic shift, so uh, giving us some insights uh, in the issue of autonomy and agency, which I was mentioning. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Giovanni. And I just want to echo Ryan's uh, remarks about how wonderful it is to be here in what is my favorite country in the world. Um, uh, only a little bit because of its historic role in roboethics and, and law and robot policy, but just because of the beauty of the people in the country. And I'm so glad to be here in this remarkable room on this remarkable campus. Uh, and, and I'm very thankful for the invitation and for the opportunity. So our panel is about autonomy. Um, this slide represents my two loves, robots and donuts. And it also sort of um, portrays uh, one of I, what I think as the essential uh, questions that arises, which are questions around the permissible delegation of tasks. And I think that fits in or complements uh, Ryan's description of a substitution paradigm. Um, but as the, as the picture that I chose very carefully illustrates, um, there are also some interesting issues around the sub-delegation uh, of tasks. Now, long ago, uh, Bruno Latour very ably taught us in his sociology uh, of mundane artifacts about the delegation of tasks to machines, and that is not new. But the delegation to machines of the means by which those tasks are achieved is indeed new. And I think that, to me, speaks to this concept that we're talking about, which has, for some reason, uh, become known as machine autonomy. Uh, this is what Ryan Kahlo once gorgeously described as the tantalizing prospect of original action. I don't know if you remember that line of yours. Um, to me, right off the bat, the notion of machine autonomy smacks of an oxymoron, right? To say um, that something is a machine is precisely to say that it has no autonomy. Uh, and to say that I have autonomy is precisely to say that I am not merely a machine. So machine autonomy to me has become included in the list of my favorite oxymorons, like jumbo shrimp or military intelligence, <laughs> academic fraternity, Microsoft Works, <laughs> and the Turbo Firefly, although that's sort of a North American joke uh, about this car made by a company called Pontiac, uh, the Pontiac Firefly, which in 1998 um, they introduced the Turbo model. Now, one doesn't Im immediately associate the Firefly or the Pontiac brand, for that matter, with turbo speed. I mean, just by way of comparison, uh, we'll take a little, little look here, um, right, the Ferrari 488 Pista. Um, now, one of the many differences between these two cars is that, in fact, the Ferrari is a manual transmission, whereas the Pontiac Turbo uh, Firefly is, is an automatic uh, transmission. And if you do a search for those two different terms for automatic transmissions, you get something that looks like this. And if you take a look at those pictures, a lot of them seem to be focusing on the stick shift 
and certainly on the internal world of the vehicle, uh, and more particularly on its transmissions. An interesting little fact, you see these uh, uh, things on here about how to drive. For a Canadian or a North American, it's very interesting to see that there are like YouTube videos on how to drive an automatic car. And as I was talking about with my wife, it's because the defaults are different, right? Here, I think almost everybody learns on a manual, on a stick shift. Uh, and so to drive an automatic car actually requires lessons. And I think there's something very interesting about that when we think about it. But now this is a search instead not for automatic vehicles, but for autonomous vehicles, because this panel is about autonomy. And when we look at these pictures, what we tend to see is that they're um, pictures uh, of the external world. They're pictures about sensors and the vehicles being able to sense what's going on in the external world. Uh, I'm going to leave the discussion about autonomous vehicles to a colleague who will speak on our panel after I will. Um, but let me just say that I think there are some interesting things. Uh, and my point is that we're shifting gears from what was once automatic cars to what are now autonomous cars. And I think in terms of a panel that's investigating the concept of autonomy, it's useful uh, to pause for a moment on that distinction. So let's talk for a moment and ask the question, what does it mean to say that a machine is automatic, right? It goes back to the Greek automatos, um, which, uh, which uh, connoted something which was acting of itself. Right? By definition, the concept of an automatic machine entails the operation is carried out without consciousness or intentionality. It happens automatically. We think of our autonomous nervous system. If we had to think about every time we would breathe, uh, our life would be very difficult. But we don't because it's automatic. In criminal law, in most countries, we even talk about people dissociating into an automatic state where they no longer have the mens rea or the guilty uh, state of mind. I think Aristotle was among the first uh, to imagine the substitution of human labor by automatic machines. And here in this passage, if every system could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, if in like manner the shuttle would weave and the plectrum touch the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants nor masters slaves. I want to leave aside for the moment the huge political ramifications uh, built into what Aristotle was getting at in his politics where he imagined robots taking over the household and how that would change society. Um, the point here is that automatic machines do exactly as they're programmed to do. They're valued precisely for their lack of discretion, for their obedience, and for their unrelenting predictability. The thing is that when something goes wrong with an atom, auto, automatic machine and it yields unintended consequences, um, we describe that as a malfunction of the machine. Something has gone wrong, and we attach uh, in our legal systems generally some form of product liability, sometimes strictly so, not paying any attention to the intentions uh, of the designer or the manufacturer, but just looking at what went wrong uh, and satisfying it there. To give the example and to carry forward the example I was talking about before um, with the automatic transmission is that if I shift my gear stick into park, I expect predictably that the vehicle will stay parked. And this has been a problem in many jurisdictions. And here's just one product liability claim, um, in this case about the unintended powered rollaway in reverse after parking of the Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee, another crappy American car. Um, but I think it's probably also important to see that automatic machines can trigger legal consequences not only when they malfunction, but in fact when they're functioning perfectly well. And I think a vending machine is a great example of this. The entire premise behind a vending machine is that it automatically executes the contractual intentions of the offeror. And there's these great old British cases where Lord Denning, the master of the roles uh, of the English Court of Appeal, talks about these uh, kinds of automatic transactions. He says, the customer pays his money and gets a ticket. He cannot refuse it. He cannot get his money back. He may protest to the machine, even swear at it. 
but it will remain unmoved. He is committed beyond recall. He was committed at the very moment when he put his money into the machine. Lord Denning then goes on to give an analysis of how we can understand that automatic machine as generating a contract as the instrumentality of the offeror who puts the offer forward and through the conduct of the offeree generates a contract in the machine. So when we automate commerce, whether it's through vending machines or whether it's through software scripts online, um, what we do is we use automatic machines uh, that, that people will use to carry out part of a transaction particularly for the purposes Ryan mentioned, which is the substitution, uh, which makes for mo more cost-effective transactions. I mention this because in 1998, I started getting interested in these questions that we're talking about in this conference. When I was asked uh, by the Canadian government to answer the question, can a computer enter into a contract? And in 1998, that was a weird question to be asking because contracts are about agreements between people and they were exclusively within the domain of, of people to use the language Ryan was talking about earlier. Um, but the question you know, could be put this way, when agreements are generated by automatic machines without human intervention, how can we understand them as contracts? And the way that people were talking about it and the way that I framed the issue back then was to introduce terminology like electronic agents. And I used that terminology quite reluctantly because I felt that the notion of an agent in law was something that tended to be reserved for human individuals or for corporations and there needed to be sort of limits around it. But at the same time, I recognized it was undeniable that software would play an agency-type role in, in the development negotiation of automated contracts. And so I likened it to ancient Rome and Roman law, uh, where in, in the old days, the praetor would have to instruct um, uh, the finder of fact to pretend that a child or a slave, even though they were not a citizen under the use civil, um, but to pretend that they were a citizen for the purposes of attribution for commerce. And so I started working to develop a set of principles for thinking about automated uh, machines being involved in contracts. Uh, since that time, and to not bore you with a long history, um, there, there has been the development and a shift from talking about automatic machines to autonomous machines, which is, of course, our topic. And somewhere along the way, the lines began to blur. A book by Samir Chopra and uh, uh, Lawrence White uh, talked as though we should treat these machines as though they had intentionality. And I'll skip the rest of the history on that and simply to say that nowadays it's commonplace to talk about autonomous vehicles, autonomous weapons, autonomous surgical robots, and the like. And it seems to me um, that we can actually go back to Aristotle then to frame a, con a concept, a uh, start of a definition about what an autonomous machine is, as opposed to an automatic machine, which I've spent most of my time talking so far. Using Aristotle's language, an autonomous machine is every instrument that could accomplish its own work obeying or anticipating the will of others. The point here still is that the machines are for our purposes, it's just that there seems to be some leeway in how the machine carries out the objectives of achieving that purpose which we have asked it uh, to carry out. Right? So maybe drilling down a bit, we might say that the concept of machine autonomy is bound up in a kind of anticipatory behavior on the part of the machine. And I think we have very good early uh, paradigmatic examples of that, and GPS is one of them, right? I tell the GPS where I want to go, but it determines the best route uh, and the ways of getting there. And it does so almost as if by magic in ways that I could never do. We just spent last week, my family, um, the first of three months in the south of France. And I could not negotiate all of those traffic circles and don't even talk to me about doing that here. Um, or, or, or navigate my way around in the same way that that GPS was able to do it. But despite this sort of autonomous, if you want to call it that, using the terminology or the framework that I've provided, despite that non autonomous uh, sort of behavior, 
Um, that in itself is a far cry um, from this sort of idea, the idea that these machines uh, somehow obtain the status of super intelligence or we might say super autonomy where uh, those machines simply by getting better and better at choosing their own means of achieving tasks and objectives somehow enter the realm of, of what we might talk about uh, a long time alongside the notion of autonomy which we usually think of as a moral notion, right? Um, by permitting a leap in, in uh, from increasing in uh, artificial intelligence to some kind of machine-based moral autonomy, it seems to me we're on the verge of making a very important category mistake. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. This was exactly the discussion I wanted to have with Nick Bostrom, who was originally invited to be on this panel, but I'm guessing could not attend. I think it's hugely problematic and dangerous and that I'm speaking of in terms of this machine metaphor. So I want to end my talk um, by getting to this notion of the agentic shift, which I think is coming from this, which relates, I think, very nicely to the question we had from the audience about automation bias um, just a few minutes back. Uh, in thinking about this panel, somehow I was led back to Neil Postman, uh, the sociologist of technology um, who I cited in the very first piece I ever wrote about internet regulation where at the time people were saying the internet was beyond human control. Uh, and, and he said in speaking about machines as if they are humans and using those kinds of metaphors, this kind of language is not merely a picturesque anthropomorphism. It reflects a profound shift in the perception about the relations of computers to human. Through a curious form of grammatical alchemy, the sentence, we use computers to calculate, comes to mean that the machine calculates. If computers calculate, then they may decide to miscalculate or not calculate at all. That is what bank tellers mean when they tell you that they cannot say how much money is in your account because the computers are down. The implication of this, of course, is that no person at the bank is responsible. Why blame people? We may call this line of thinking, says Postman, an agentic shift, a term I borrow from Stanley Milgram to name a process whereby humans transfer responsibility for an outcome from themselves uh, to a more abstract agent. When this happens, we've relinquished control, which in the case of a computer means that we may, without excessive remorse, pursue ill-advised or even inhumane goals because the computer can accomplish them or be imagined to accomplish them. Okay, so it's this agentic shift, this process whereby humans transfer responsibility from an outcome to the, from themselves to a more abstract agent uh, that I think is interesting exploring as we move more and more to talking about machine autonomy. Um, this term, of course, comes from the Milgram experiments, which I don't have time uh, to get into, but it only takes a moment's reflection for myself in thinking about using GPS on the French motorways to sort of have a recognition of the kind of technological alchemy as I become an agent of the system of the machine merely carrying out driving tasks without having a clue where I'm going, without having any decisional autonomy in terms of the route that I'm choosing and whatnot. And the point is that this works. It works very well and it's beneficial to us. But we are engaged in an, uh, what, what Milgram would have called an agentic shift. We move from an autonomous state, a state where we are responsible uh, for the choices and outcomes that we make, to an agentic state where we rely on some abstract authority to, to uh, be responsible for telling us how to carry out uh, whatever actions it is uh, that we ultimately want to carry out. I want to end um, by just laying a hypothesis on you and giving a quick example. And my hypothesis is that AI will reduce our human beings' decisional autonomy, uh, causing profound agentic shifts of the short sort that I have described. Sometimes these will be unproblematic and in fact quite beneficial, uh, but in other cases there are things that I think uh, we need to think about very seriously. So in thinking about that, um, it's important to think about some of the risks that come with this and I'll end with my uh, um, um, single example of one of the risks. One of the risks that I see happening here is that as we 
um, become more and more to perform the role of the agent rather than of the, of the principal. Uh, and AI becomes sort of the principle to which we are following or carrying out um, ultimately its tasks. Um, AI will itself has a, have an autonomous shift, a shift in the other direction, a reversal of what Milgram called the agentic shift. In other words, um, as we more and more come into being in agentic states, uh, we will come to see or we will project or we will attribute to the machines that they are in autonomous states. And I think that's exactly the kind of thing um, that happens in, um, um, in Nick Bostrom's book uh, in Imagining Superintelligent Machines. And as this happens, uh, indisputably, autonomous machines will be seen more and more as authorities. Uh, they will be seen as expert uh, and their decisions will be seen as authoritative. And I think Ryan provided a good example uh, in his discussion, which is exactly the answer, uh, uh, example I was going to use. We start to see things like IBM Watson um, coming up uh, with diagnoses which had doctors previously hadn't come up with. Now, let's think about the anthropomorphic or anthropomorphization here. Really what's happening, of course, is that Watson, a machine, a computer program, um, has great pattern recognition skills and is able to recognize a pattern which doctors then use to make the right diagnosis. That's what's happening at least so far today. But what we start to see is headlines like this. IBM Watson is therefore a better, is better at diagnosing cancer uh, than human doctors. And we see those kind of examples more and more as we anthropomorphize the machine. And just as my final sort of go-to example here, I don't need to talk to this crowd too much about this in incredible game where AlphaGo, DeepMind's um, AI, beat the human grandmaster uh, at the game of Go. Um, but I will say something which most people don't talk that much about. They talk about the victory and the fact that there's been yet another AI that has performed these human type skills and has, in this case, displayed human type intuition. But there was a very important moment, move 37 in game two of that match. And the, the announcer, the commentator, Fang Hu, who was the, the World Go champion previously, uh, described AlphaGo's move as a rare and intriguing shoulder hit and went on to say, it's not a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. It is so beautiful, so beautiful, so beautiful, he said three times. Meanwhile, David Silver and a number of the team members from Google Minds went up to their hotel room and tried to figure out what the hell was going on um, because they didn't know why AlphaGo made this move. And that's the point here, is that this uh, machine learning is a great exemplifier of what Ryan has called emergent behavior. And I think, Ryan, you were exactly right to call it that and not to focus on autonomy because it has something to do with the complexity of the way a machine which is programmed to go beyond its own programming, creates these unexpected results of which it is very tempting to think of them as making autonomous moves. These machines are unpredictable by design. And I'll end just by saying there's a, a regulatory conundrum that comes with that, right? When we start adopting machines based on evidence-based reasoning that those machines outperform human experts, and they outperform human experts uh, in an important way um, because they do things that the humans wouldn't have expected them to do. They behave unpredictably and they display emergent behavior. We're going to have to figure out how to deal with that when we had a law which was primarily developed for automatic machines at best, where the behaviors and outcomes of these things were completely predictable. That's the question I think we should uh, talk a little bit more throughout the next two days, I hope a little bit, at least insofar as we're talking about autonomy. I apologize, I know I went on a bit long, but thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, I need some automatic device that helps me. <laughs>
in better managing my speech. But uh, um, so thank you very much for this uh, a great presentation. When you connect, let me say, the kind of factual and the normative aspect of autonomy, and in particular addressing uh, this issue of uh, the issue of delegation. This is also an old issue that comes to my mind. Um, um, the famous um, dialectic of slave, um, uh, of master and slave uh, in uh, Hegel and 19th century philosophy, who had the idea that uh, by delegating uh, everything to the slave, then the master loses the ability to do anything. He becomes a mere kind of desire machine, having desires, but not being able to, to, um, um, to satisfy them um, without uh, the action of the, of the slave. Um, there is time for one uh, or two questions, uh, um, even the, if the time is, uh, is very limited. Uh, any kind of... Uh, um, I would like to make you so a question, a question to you, uh, Jan. Um, so you um, provided us... Uh, um, now your presentation may be in a way puzzling to me because uh, on the one hand uh, you argue that we should not uh, have uh, autonomy in machine or... And then, uh, on the other hand, you said that it is not possible to make machine autonomous. So if it's not possible to have autonomous uh, uh, machine, so uh, the problem that you mentioned maybe does not exist, uh, or is just a misinterpretation of reality. Yes, so my concern um, lays less with um, an ultimate determination of whether machines have the kind of moral autonomy that would be interesting, the kinds of things that Nick Bostrom is interested in asking. I, I think those are interesting speculative questions, but uh, like my friends in the United States who started the institute called AI Now, I, I love the name of that institute because it's AI Now. We have serious problems um, facing us with discrimination and equality and all of the kinds of things that have been mentioned so far. So speculating about superintelligence to me seems a luxury that maybe most of us can't afford uh, uh, to do. But uh, I guess in, in particular response to your question, what I would say is this. My concern is that people will ascribe or imbue autonomy in the machines and that it's that perception uh, of the autonomy that will lead to certain kinds of regulatory responses that are problematic or wrong-headed, right? And in many ways, you know, this is, this is just one instantiation of everything that I think was problematic in the, in the amazing uh, Turing test and the, the whole imitation game. Um, it, it, it shows what was problematic, but it shows also what was insightful in Turing. To me, what was so insightful in Turing was he recognized as an externalist uh, that what was powerful was whether we thought the machine um, was a human being and whether it was capable of deceiving us. And so what this tells us is that the perceptions that we, we place around these things matter in serious and important ways. And my concern, to directly answer your question, is that the perception of this kind of strong capital A autonomy in the moral sense uh, in machines, so people who are, are focused on whether we should uh, be giving robots rights and treating them in particular ways, um, that that skews or at least obfuscates some of the questions that I think we should be focusing on with robotics and AI now. <laughs> Thanks, Cathy. I really need it. Uh, so um, now I'm going to uh, give the floor to uh, Fiorella Operto. Fiorella has been working on science dissemination and uh, popularization, but uh, she has been a pioneer also at the interface um, of uh, ethics and artificial intelligence. And um, um, she is now in particular president of the School of Robotics, uh, which she co-founded in uh, 2000. Um, so, um, Fiorella, without further ado, I'm happy to give you the floor. Thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be with uh, you and also with uh, many uh, scholars I have. I have read of in uh, all this series of robotics. Just a few words, robotics was started by Professor Verugio and um, roboticists from all over the world and humanity, uh, scholars of humanities in 2004. And from then it became an applied ethics 
used in, uh, employed in uh, um, all the project of the uh, European Commission concerned with robotics and human relations. And it, it is also one of the applied ethics uh, now used by ESO, uh, service robotics, uh, especially today. Um, Professor Verugio could not come for a serious family issues, and I'm glad to, to be with you today. Uh, we thought to, um, to use the uh, case of driverless cars to um, compare the uh, working or so-called, what you ha we know about working of robots, they are robots, these machines, with the underlying ethics uh, embodied in all the decisions made by uh, the car companies. Uh, Professor Kerr mentioned Latour, and I think that uh, one inspiration for us would be Bruno Latour's Who Killed Aramis. Uh, <coughs> it's a book where uh, Latour make, let uh, the machines speak by themselves. Because somehow we, uh, we do not let machines speak. You know, we, we interpret their working behavior, their performance, and we always adapt our may, uh, way of thinking to the machines. So Bruno Latour reversed and said, machines rebel and said, no, basta, uh, enough is enough, we want to speak by ourselves. Um, I'm totally blind. Um, autonomous cars uh, started in 2009 with Google Car, and now, uh, and more and more, all the car companies, you know, jumped on because, you know, the, uh, this is the law of the, of the market. Uh, and now uh, we have many, almost all the um, major in uh, car pr uh, production um, prototyping uh, driverless cars. These are almost robots, and um, these are, uh, there are um, states, United States, like Arizona, who is offering, you know, a, um, more flexibility to uh, driverless cars, you know, to be used in uh, geofenced uh, area, but also non-geofenced area. Um, this is a, you know, this, the, the car who was just uh, texting an SMS and, uh, you know, made an, an accident. In fact, uh, in March uh, 18 of this year, um, a, an Uber car uh, killed a woman in a, um, in a road. Uh, this woman was not crossing the, uh, the road, it was just, you know, bicycle bicycling on, uh, on, the, on the side. And this was uh, the, the biggest accident, you know, uh, for a driver's car. There were other accidents f with fatalities, a Tesla car, also a light accident of Google car some years ago. But this accident really, uh, you know, uh, opened a big discussion and also all the uh, major ca uh, car companies just stopped you know, the um, non-geofenced uh, prototyping text. Now, this is a robot, not, and it is full of autonomy, um, let's say level two. Um, these are cars with a lot of sensors, lidars, um, infrared touch sensor, etc. plus a very powerful, for now, uh, artificial intelligence and capability to get uh, data from any possible source. Maps. What we, with Professor Rucho and myself, try to convey to you is the underlying assumptions companies have adopted, but without transparency without telling, you know, the consumer that they adopted such uh, modalities for driverless car, uh, implying that 
you know, the ethics embodied is not important. Uh, what we try to uh, study, you know, in concerning the uh, behavior of a driverless car, but we could apply to surgery robotics, uh, service robotics, domestic robotics, military robotics as well, is their way of behaving. Um, to have a safety depend dependable driverless car, the, the car needs to have very precise maps. You know, maps of the uh, road they are uh, driving on. Because on these maps, the decision, quote unquote, of the cars is based on. Now, you see here a Rome trafficked street, but, you know, expert says that you know, to, to give the, 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 this maximum safety of, um, to the, these cars, we have to uh, map a million of kilometers in many different conditions, weather, traffic, light, etc., etc. So when companies say level two, level three, level two is and ends off three go, ma level five is mind off. That means that the drive, the occupant, um, gives to the car all the control of the car. Now the company says, uh, oh, level five, we are quite near. Other expert, more responsible, said no. To have real le level five, the car should have the possibility to get in real time precise map, maps of the road the car is driving in all the weather conditions. So the ethical issues is the companies have to ensure that this pre precision, the safety is 100% allowed. Now, in reality, in our world, you know, as you know, we have 3,000 people in the US only losing their lives to cars in every year. Um, this is not a very much a problem for us, apparently. You know. um, no one wants to uh, diminish the speed to, to, to buy a car that has a very strict speed limit, and no one really would like to have this limitation. Um, in fact, for a driverless car, this limitation should be important because uh, maybe as society, we do not care too much about all these lives, but if one accident of a driverless car should happen, this is a real drama, and this is what really happened with the Tempa, Tempe. Now, from the ethical standpoint, we say um, that the safety of the driverless car should be good, and the companies, they say it's good. But from ethical standpoint, how much good is for us? How can we coach, how we can evaluate what goodness is for us if a machine is killing a human being. And how good should be a driverless car not to kill anyone more than us, that 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%, this is the ethical embodied in the uh, dependability and safety of the driverless car. Uh, you all know the so-called trolley paradox, you know, of a driverless car. You know, your, your car is driving on a road and then suddenly you cannot do anything, you cannot intervene. The car has to decide whether to kill an old lady or two kids because it cannot do anything else, only, you know, uh, moving right or uh, left. Now, this paradox is interesting, although it's a bit misleading. If it is treated as thought experiment, it could be quite interesting because it, 
can you know, put forward many interesting ethical and legal issues. If it's treated as a real issue, is a bit misleading because um, it, the car is seen as a um, human being. In fact, I mean, we are simply putting on a car all the dilemma a human being would have um, that many, many of us had already in many occasions a dilemma that a surgeon uh, has to face when he has to deal with saving baby or the mother, etc. But it, it, it is interesting. Now, an expert, that it's Toyota, um, Toyota um, Center for Scientific Research on Cars, Gil Pratt said, the real paradox for me is the over-trusting autonomy paradox. Because in our psychology, because of science fiction, or maybe some still positivistic, futuristic, futuristic tendency in our uh, philosophy of life, we tend to rely too much on machines. And that is a problem. And he said, the worst case, if, if uh, the driver or the occupant has a car that never, never had any accident, and this is really bad because this occupant has no idea of what an, a, an accident by a driverless car is, and he will say, as in our psychology, if this didn't happen until now, it won't happen never. This is our normal way of thinking. So, uh, Gil Pratt said, we are very scared about the fact that occupant consumers rely too much on the so-called autonomy of a driverless car. Again, ethics in the economy of promises. So what is autonomy? It was already discussed by Professor Carlo and Kerr. Autonomy is the capability to fulfill a mission by a robot, a, a program or a ordered mission with success. Um, this um, autonomy is a, the capability to um, learn, sorry for these words, I, I do not have any other words to say, learn from the environment and more the environment is um, anthropologic, anthropomorphic and more is um, difficult to understand, more intelligence you have to put in the robot because he has to, to get all the um, data and he has to uh, fusion, uh, sensing, sensor fusion of this data and adapt to the, to the possible behavior he has been programmed. Now, as I said, from an ethical standpoint, is it right that companies say that they will get to level five in 2000 uh, and uh, 25, and experts say no, it will take longer because a real autonomy means that the car will not kill no human being. Deep machine learning. Um, there is a theorem uh, say, that says that robots that uh, have the capacity to learn uh, have also unpredictable behavior. And this theorem has been proved in many instances. And more robots are intelligent, more they have capability to uh, put all the data and use all the data, and uh, more pattern of uh, behavior they have embodied in it, uh, more unpredictability is uh, in their behavior. Can you imagine all the data a driverless car has to collect and process in a second to take this decision to, uh, to kill either the, the old lady or the, the two girls? Imagine this situation. Now, the problem is that no expert could say what really did happen in this situation, you know, that it's the uh, comma of the 
unpredictability of the, dry, of, of the autonomy of car, cars. In all this uh, accident in, performed by the driverless cars, experts said it's impossible to, until now, to get any idea what did happen because of the many intelligent, um, peripheral intelligence operating, the data collect, collect, collection, the architecture of the decision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, experts said that are working on the car that can explain uh, just because, uh, despite the black boxes you put in these robots, it's really hard to, to, to get to the conclusion of what really did happen. The other ethical issue in uh, the autonomy of the average car experts are working on is the simulation of the crazy driver's performance. And this is a, such an issue that in 2015, Elon Musk, who had put um, a, a video on the, uh, on the Tesla uh, car, driver's car, simply took it because humans were doing all the crazy things you can imagine, shaving, reading books, uh, dancing, etc., etc. So this again, you know, make us think that um, are we ready for such an autonomy? I mean, our society is really ready for such a robots. In conclusion, we think that um, we have to work with experts in robotics to understand precisely how, if it's possible, and up to, the po up to at what point, understand robots' behavior. This is very important. We can also go on with thought experiments, you know, debating and conversating about, you know, what robot can do, but applying our own state of mind, our own way of thinking. Um, we think that, you know, understanding really what is going on in a robotics intelligent is quite important, especially because the transparency of the decision by robotics producer and programmer should be of the utmost important. Uh, there are ethical decisions taken without even knowing that these decisions are taken, and this should be transparent. Um, I have to thank my colleague, Patrick Lynn, Siciliano Tamborini, and Verugio for this um, research that will uh, come out in a paper soon. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, please. Um, so I thought it was interesting when you asked the question, um, how good is good enough, um, which is obviously sort of the essence of, uh, of any moral quandary. Um, and perhaps this is more of a comment, but I sort of put it to you that that answer has to be culturally relative. And if you take a more utilitarian calculus, the answer could be simply that you're saving more lives than you were before, right? Um, certainly, <coughs> when driverless car will be um, safely and dependable enough, um, we can imagine that they could save um, many lives, at least more lives than are killed today, if, if our society, if the occupant are trained and educated enough to use these robots. Because as it was said, robots are, I mean, we talk a lot, a lot about robots, but where are them, you know? I mean, we are anticipating, you know, because the, the market is anticipating our desires to make us apt to buy all these robots when they will be on the shelves. Uh, but, um, the society should be ready to use these machines because are complex 
and very, very powerful. So power means more responsibility. Um, I know that United States, the traffic uh, agency already asked the uh, producer companies the ethical um, uh, assumption embodied in their decision. This is a very good step. I think that all these steps should be put forward uh, soon. Uh, very quickly. Um, I'm, I'm very much interested in uh, all the debate that you also referred to that is happening also at the IEEE level on, on ethically aligned design. And, and some of the previous question also triggered that idea in me, but the very difficult issue I believe is what kind of ethics. I don't think, uh, so I, I don't think that we can agree in this very room on what kind of ethics should be embedded in robots. So I think the major question is not technical, but it's, uh, it's again ethical. So the answer that was just given is uh, utilitarian ethics. I, I'm not so sure that I would agree uh, with uh, utilitarian ethics. Um, at the same time, um, even if I might prefer a Kantian ethics or uh, some other kind of, uh, if we had to conceive a driverless car and in, in the trolley case, uh, uh, find a solution of that, of that problem, um, I, the, the other things that we have to take into account is we have to find a car that uh, uh, will be sold. So <laughs> ultimately, if, if I'm designing a vehicle and I design it in a way that it's ethically compliant but nobody <laughs> is willing to sit in that car because they're afraid of what could, would happen in the, in the case of an accident, I, I don't sell that, that, that car on the market. So uh, ultimately, the, the, the solution could be that the choice is made by the market. So the ethical choice is is is, is made by uh, is is made by the market, and this is something that a bit you know troubles me. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, thank you for your question. In fact, uh, what kind of ethics uh, should be embodied in the ro robots? It's really a key key question. Um, I agree. We don't as a school of robotics. We don't think that utilitarianism is a is an ethics that's really um, safe for humans. We rely more on Erolians, you know, ethics that it's what if the society is learning about what it's doing, uh, it, an, an ethics of consciousness, of responsibility, to, it will come out. Thank you. I'd like to ask some questions, but. Um, um, Time uh, is uh, short uh, and we, mo we must move on. So um, I move to the next, um, to introduce the next uh, speaker, um, Virgin Vir Virginia Dignum. Virginia, she's uh, Associate Professor at, uh, Social Artificial, of Social Artificial Intelligence at the Faculty of Technology Policy and Management at the Deft University of Technology in the Netherlands, which is a leading uh, institute uh, in uh, research uh, on technology and ethics. Uh, and uh, Virginia, she's a computer scientist, uh, but her research focuses on the connection between computer science, uh, in particular artificial intelligence and uh, uh, social and ethical issues. Uh, so I'm very happy to uh, give, the floor, give the floor to, um, uh, to Virginia for her presentation on responsible uh, artificial intelligence. I, uh, I have a technical problem. I need to put my presentation on the. I didn't send it before, so can I use a cable or can I give the presentation to someone which will put it on the screen? Uh, or where is the computer with the presentations? There. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry about this. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and I actually should thank Andrea for his uh, questions because it was a very nice introduction to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, 
when we talk about artificial intelligence, it is a tendency nowadays to focus only on the learning aspects of uh, the systems, but actually any artificial intelligence system should be a system in which we take care in equal parts about not only its learning and adapt adaptability uh, aspects, but also uh, taking into account the autonomy and especially the fact that these systems are in one way or another going to interact with us. And by taking all these things together, then we uh, should start, and if you want to take a responsible approach, then we should start to wonder why, w what means and why should we care about responsibility and ethics and uh, normative regulation issues in this type of systems. So one of the issues is that we expect and we see these systems increasingly being autonomous, taking uh, decisions without a directly link to um, a human. In another end, we all have this idea that somehow these systems will at some time make better decisions than humans. Of course, the issue here is what is better. That is not the issue which I'm going to take in this uh, presentation, but it's an issue to, to discuss for another one. The main issue is that AI is a design, is something that we develop, is an artifact, and therefore the decisions, the responsibility, the uh, accountability is uh, what we need to take into account. And because we are designing these systems, we should very much take into account that we need to be sure w that the purpose we put in the systems is the purpose that we really want. This is something which is definitely not new, is uh, uh, proposed and is uh, stated by Norbert Wiener already in the 60s. Uh, Stuart Russell is someone which uh, keeps uh, reinforcing this one, and we see it already in the tale of King Midas from uh, very long ago. So we have to be sure that when we design something, we know that the purpose, that we know which purpose we want, and we know that that purpose is uh, indeed made explicit in the artifacts that we're building. So responsible AI has a lot of questions, a lot of issues, uh, basically, about who is going to decide what is going into the system. if. Uh, taking into account that this type of systems can do a lot of things, should they do all what is possible? If not, we should decide which are the values that we should consider, and from who are those values who are we going to ask and to decide uh, to take in, uh, the values to take into account? How are we going to deal with dile dilemmas, and how should we prioritize these values? So basically, the idea of responsible AI is about setting and deciding and discussing ourselves with which type of technical, ethical, and societal boundaries we uh, want to uh, consider. Uh, in the work we have been doing in Delft, we see this as in three different ways. Uh, taking responsibility means that we have to look at ethics in design, meaning the ethics that we take in the design processes, the, the, the process that we take to design uh, artificial intelligence systems and to design robotic systems as they integrate and replace traditional systems and societal structures. Then we look at ethics by design, and by that we mean the, the design of the development of systems, uh, uh, artificial systems, which are themselves in somehow aware of ethical reasoning and aware and able in somehow to take those ethical concerns into the reasoning that they make, so the, let's say the technical, uh, the engineering aspect of the ethics. And finally, we also should look at the ethics for the designers themselves and to take into account the research integrity of all the stakeholders that are involved in designing, constructing, using, and managing these systems. I will go uh, quickly in this presentation uh, about these three issues. Um, but before, uh, uh, there is a, a lot of discussion, and I have been giving this talk to many, uh, many people. There is always this issue, both from business and also from developers, the, the engineers, my, my own colleagues, about that idea, once we start talking about ethics, we're starting about regulation, then things are going to, uh, uh, we are going to be restrict, our business uh, possibilities are going to be curtailed, our research uh, freedom is going to be taking, uh, uh, being less, so there is a a lot of issues and concerns about that. And the uh, uh, examples that I give is two. In one hand is the example of the free-range egg, farmers which choose explicitly for 
a more ethical approach to uh, producing eggs, one which takes some values, in this case the values of uh, ecological and uh, animal welfare into the, their business proposition. They do make a lot of better business choice and also they have, a, at least in the Netherlands, a much larger business impact than the ones who don't take those ethical choices. So there is a business to be made by being ethical. Uh, and the other one is about the development, uh, the use of uh, ethical restrictions or uh, restrictions based on some ethical and value principles. That thing there is a catalyst of a car, which were introduced in the Netherlands, in the Europe like 30 years ago. Cars were obliged to have one of these things in, uh, in order to uh, mitigate the amount of pollution that those cars are uh, uh, distributing. I was working for, uh, for Volvo at that time. And I know that the, the researchers at those companies were very, very, very concerned. Yeah, this thing, and now we have all these obligations to uh, ensure this uh, stupid thing. We don't want it. It's going to make better designs. Our cars will be worse, and it will be all. We were very, very upset about it. And in fact, it was completely the opposite. By enforcing and by regulating, uh, in this case, the catalyst and taking into account the value of uh, uh, clean air and the better, uh, better air for people, we have nowadays, 30 years later, much better cars, much better designs, much efficient, much more uh, economic and much more uh, efficient than what we would have had if those restrictions were not in position. So this is just to set up that the idea of ethics and regulations and ensuring human values into design of AI systems can be a benefit and will be a benefit and not the curse that in many cases people look at. So let's go back to my uh, three uh, topics. Ethics in design is uh, based on the idea that because these systems are going whether we want or not, and we are, uh, they will do that explicit or not, they are going to take decisions which can be considered by, to have ethical grounds and ethical consequences. Moreover, there are many choices in design and many choices in the uh, decisions that these systems will take. So we'll need to have design methods which ensure accountability, responsibility, and transparency, which we call the art of AI, ART. Oh, the, the eggs are there, sorry. Um, and accountability, we uh, talk about the idea of, it's about having explanation, having justification, having possibilities to uh, inquire the system about what it's doing, but it's also about the way we design these systems, making it explicit, the values that are behind. By responsibility, we have uh, a lot of issues concerning autonomy, concerning the, the chain of actors, and also the our responsibility in the design of systems who look like humans, and in transparency, of course, has to do with the data and algorithms. Uh, in accountability challenges, the main challenge is that, especially from a uh, technological and engineering perspective, optimal AI is not AI which is the most efficient and the most quicker and the most, uh, it's the AI which is expla explainable. Developing systems which uh, inherently don't, en don't enable uh, inquiring and explanation is not the way that we want it to go. So we want to make sure that we have some uh, explanation, so there should be some human level understanding, which doesn't mean that everybody which uses an AI system will be able to qu inquire that system in the same way. These explanations should be based in the social heuristics that we use ourselves to explain to each other what we do, which means that probably can also be constructed a posteriori uh, like we do in our own explanations. But what is important is that there is a very explicit uh, description of how uh, moral and societal values, which ones were uh, decided upon, how we interpret that into the norms that we are uh, building, the rules which we are designing our system to uh, comply with, and how we concretize those issues in the functionalities of the systems. If we don't make this type of uh, links explicit, then it's very difficult to later on understand why systems were the, the, uh, doing a, a certain way and how, uh, how, uh, the function, why those functionalities are there and what are those functionalities doing. Which means that this type of uh, uh, structure should be verifiable and should be formalized in a way that can be also probably uh, doing what they are supposed to do. If we talk uh, the, about the responsibilities, let me go quickly. 
the idea is that, and it has been stressed by previous speakers already, autonomy is not kind of one, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> autonomy is not a one thing, one on, which is on or off. There are many levels of autonomy, and even for us as people, we are never fully autonomous because we have to take the constraints of our uh, physical and societal environment, and it is the same for systems. So a system which we give the autonomy, like the, the car GPS, to uh, find as the best route is not, we don't want that system to also be autonomous to decide the destination of our travel. And uh, another issue which really concerns autonomy is the issue of designing systems who look or uh, can be interpreted as being persons. Uh, just last week was the issue of the Google uh, duplex, which uh, in interacts by voice in a way that people don't really understand anymore, which is a machine or not. So the responsibility here means that we at least should sit down and dis think about whether it's beneficial and why is it beneficial to design these systems which are not anymore indistinguishable from a person and how can we and should do, do people have the right to know that they are interacting with the system or they are interacting or not whether it is an artificial system or not and especially when we are taking into account vulnerable users such as children and elderly uh, the transparency uh, let me just go to the next slide because we have the idea uh, most about transparency, and there is a lot of work and a lot of issues, like you all know, about algorithmic transparency, but I believe that there is much more to be done around the process in which we design these algorithms, about, uh, around the process on which we decide which data we are using for training, for uh, this, uh, to taking decisions and so on. If we are open and transparent about all those processes, if we have uh, explicit what were the choices, which were the options, how the data has been governed, which data has been used for uh, governing and to uh, regulating and to uh, train these systems. We are already making a lot of work which is in a sense pretty simple, it's something which we can do without very complex ways of uh, looking at the transparency of the algorithm and which can lead us a long way towards being explicit and taking into account that uh, uh, and providing a much more um, uh, trustful and uh, trusted uh, approach to the, to the systems that we are developing. And this is just a list of all the kind of things we can look at which are all very uh, functional, very uh, uh, possible to do with the means and the uh, things that we have now without really going into very complex mathematical uh, explanations of the uh, uh, transparency of the algorithms. So let's go now to the ethics by design. So the idea, can we build artifacts which somehow are ethical inside? And what does that mean? And what is then needed to do that? And uh, the idea here is that we would need, if we want to build this type of systems, at least three things we need to, uh, make, to, to be able to make explicit. First, we have to identify which values we want this system to be um, uh, taking into account. Uh, are there any universal human values that we can put into the systems? If they are not, then how we are going to decide and who is going to decide? Who are we going to ask which value should go into the, the self-driving car? Is that the whole of mankind? Is uh, only the people who develop it? Is only the governments? How we are going to do that? So that's something which is uh, completely outside of the design of the system itself, but which we need to have into place before we can even consider designing these systems. If we imagine that we do get this list of values, this is what the system should be taking into account, then we still need to decide how to design the behavior of these systems. And the discussion was already a bit that uh, there are many ethical systems and there are many ways to do it and we don't really, and culturally and uh, societally, we already don't understand ourselves and we don't agree on those things so that will be even more complex for the systems. And then we still have to 
take the decision of how to implement, are we going to implement it all purely algorithmic, or are we going to give some uh, role to the society and to institutions to take care of that? Just to give you an example, and it comes back to the example of the self-driving car and the whole idea that the car should be able to take an ethical decision whenever it is confronted with this type of decisions in which you have to kill the people in the road or the people in the car or the whatever, all kind of these things. If we assume that the value here that the car should maximize or should take into account is the, the value of human life, only looking very uh, uh, simplistically at the three, main, uh, at three of the main uh, ethical theories existing, we already see that the car will get to many different types of behaviors. And which one are we going to take? How can we go later to, um, to a uh, car stand and uh, ask for a car which behaves in the Kantian way or the Aristotelian way or whatever? It, it is something which is for us to decide. Of course, technically, it is possible to take one of these things as the way to design the systems, but it is not a question or a decision that should be left, leave, left to the engineers. It's a decision that we have to take as a society. And the, the engineers, of, if we leave it to the engineers, they will make a decision, probably an implicit one. No one thought about it. It's just one which somehow happened to uh, derive or appear from the kind of uh, um, techniques that we use. But the decision is something which is for the society, not for the engineers. So that leads us to the ethically aligned design and the role, the, the role uh, the IEEE has been the, uh, um, ethically aligned design initiative has been already uh, mentioned. The idea here is that we need to, uh, <coughs> engineers and especially uh, computer scientists, AI engineers are increasingly being a type of uh, community, a professional community in which society increasingly depends on. We have been depending on doctors, on military, on accountants and whatever as societies for many years. Those professions have codes of conduct the computer scientists not. So maybe it's one of the issues about ethics for designers, ethics for developers, is to take into account what do we want that uh, engineer, uh, AI engineer who is going to develop all these type of algorithms, what do we want these people to be able to uh, say yes or no to what type of um, questions and what type of uh, issues. It's also about taking into uh, account the potential of AI to be designed for good or for profit, for people or for business, and taking this type of decisions into account. Uh, fortunately, or there is a huge uh, lot of work being done in the last year, at least, on all types of initiatives going around and appearing all over. AI now has been decided, it's not uh, mentioned already, but there are many initiatives around the world in which people uh, at all levels of development and of involvement into AI are aware of the need for this type of taking ethics for the designers and for the developers seriously. So I think that there is a lot uh, coming out, will be coming out in the next years. But actually the message is that if we want to take responsibility, uh, responsible artificial intelligence central, the issue is not to make this, the systems or to give the responsibility to the systems, but is to keep the responsibility with us, the people, and we all in, across the whole of uh, humankind are responsible for the systems that we develop. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Virginia, for this uh, very broad uh, picture uh, that uh, uh, shows the various, the many aspects and the connection between the many aspects that are involved uh, in uh, uh, the design and regulation of the uh, AI system. Um, for a couple of questions uh, um, before the coffee break, which has been moved uh, to uh, 11.15, so. So maybe, uh, maybe, I, would like, uh, maybe <laughs> I would like to, um, to ask you something, Virginia. Ah, sorry, please. Um, <laughs> thank you, that was fascinating. So I'm, I'm most interested, uh, I'm Margot Kaminsky, I'm a professor at the Colorado Law School in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've been spending a lot of time uh, banging my head against the right to explanation in the GDPR. Mm -hmm. So I was particularly interested in your discussion of explanations and the importance of sort of creating a, um, a version of an explanation of AI that is understandable to an individual. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I, I am not familiar with your work, so I want you to help me get there. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you also in this conversation talk about the need for sort of multimodal uh, versions of explanations where in addition to having a, an explanation that's given, that's targeted at individual understanding, there's, you know, the expert version of transparency yeah. or the, yeah. um, you know, the, the experimental version of transparency, et cetera, where you kind of create these layers of, yeah. of yeah. explanation or different disclosure types to different individuals. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. So I indeed explanation is not uh, one thing which is the system is explained, uh, one on-off kind of thing. Uh, there are many levels of explanation. There are also many, uh, uh, targets of explanation, and there is not a, a one-size-fits-all fit, approach. So we do really have to take into account the context in which this explanation is going to be given. The who is this explanation being given to? Is that to a, a policymaker? Is that to a techno, uh, engineer? Is that to the user of the system? And all those type of explanations will be different and will be not necessarily kind of uh, just one uh, level of abstraction uh, of each other. So we really have to take different approaches to this type. And that's why I mentioned the social heuristics. We also ourselves use all types of heuristics to decide how to explain something to you or something to someone else to a child, to a user, to whoever. So we do need to look at those social heuristics and that's something which uh, has to come not only from the, the AI, the computer scientists, but from uh, so, um, social science and to see how those heuristics are applied in, in society in the way that we exp explain to each other and see how that can be transferred and uh, learned from for the case of systems. A very brief follow-up to that is um, that seems like that creates an extraordinarily difficult problem for engineers, right? Because if you have if you have this this conversation where you come to them and say, okay, create make this system explainable in this particular context to this particular person, mm -hmm. but then the response may be, okay, I can build this so that it's explainable in the way you've asked me. But if you come to them and say, I need this to be explainable in like seven different ways at seven different levels of depth, that becomes yeah. a lot more complicated of a conversation to have. Not impossible, but I'm curious about how you address that. Yeah. Yes and no, and that's why then I referred to the, all the transparency who can be put around the system itself, which enables, if the, the engineer is able to make the assumptions all uh, open and explicit, the decisions that were taken all open and explicit, the requirements, the stakeholders, so if the, all, the, the data concern, the data use, where the data comes from, how is the data being governed, how, which data was used for training, so all these are questions which can just be uh, simply uh, uh, list of uh, uh, a list of questions. If we can make all that explicit, and it is basically not much more than what we already have for many years of sound software engineering principles. If we really make sure that we seriously take those type of principles into account, we already have a lot of the setup for the explanation without really needing to deal with it from a technical or an engineering perspective. So there is much more to explanation than just making algorithms that are explainable. It's the, the context in which we are developing those algorithms. Mm -hmm. I just pointed to my, yeah. <laughs> Hans, okay, this. This constant talk about transparency makes me really nervous because transparency doesn't help per se, yeah? So no. I think uh, what is really needed if you look at it from a normative perspective, is to link it to um, comprehensibility or something like this, yeah? because then you have the addressee within it, but then you would have a very different normative system and it would create tons of problems. That's one point. The second point is on, on, on values. Maybe there's room at a later stage, but um, I'm, I'm wondering to, sorry, I'm, I'm wondering to what extent let's say, our, our, the interaction between consumer scientists and lawyers is pre-designed by um, values that can be translated into consumer science, yeah? So, mm -hmm. example, discrimination, yeah, seems to be uh, the upcoming top super value, yeah? 
But is it this what we want in a society as the major ethical standard, discrimination? Yeah. So, and that is linked to, I think, to the to how it can be programmed. So I'm yeah. I'm I'm it's a bit stuck here. Yeah. It's uh, fun or, uh, nice that you mentioned discrimination. Actually, my very first system which I really had uh, the realization that there are human, uh, moral values involved was like 20 years ago. And it was exactly about discrimination, was developing a, s a European system for uh, organ donation in which the main requirement from the European Union was that thing cannot discriminate. And we as engineers thought, oh, that's very simple. We don't really keep in our databases information about age and about uh, gender and about uh, uh, race. So then we are definitely will not discriminate. It was a bit a problem because for order donation, we do need those three aspects as part of the, the decision making. But indeed, the, the point is not, uh, there are two issues here. One is to decide what do we mean by whatever the discrimination is, as a society, or the, whatever the values are, in this case, discrimination, as a society, as the ones who are involved in it. And then there is a all uh, very, uh, needs to be a all very explicit process of indicating how we translate and inform and uh, uh, concretize this type of very abstract, very uh, fuzzy type of uh, concepts into something which an, a system can deal with. And uh, the transparency, I think, is not so much on the how is the system in, inside the system doing it, but it's exactly about being transparent about the decisions that we take from going from the very, very high abstract concept of discrimination to the very concrete functionalities of the system. So if we make that process clear, that's why I think it's where transparency should be focusing and not so much on the, the system itself. Thank you very much, Virginia. I also had a question for you, but uh, <laughs> not this time, because now there is the coffee break. Okay. Uh, I would like to thank everybody, and in particular the speaker of this session, which I enjoyed uh, very much. So.